the newest podcast covering all aspects of the biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel industries is here. From the experts at Clean Fuels Alliance America, it's the Better, Cleaner, Now podcast. Authentic conversations uncovering the dynamic benefits of clean renewable fuels. From enhanced performance and immediate cost savings to lower emissions, positive economic impact, and improved air quality. The benefits keep growing. This is the Better, Cleaner, Now podcast with your host, Scott Tremaine. And welcome. Today, Clean Fuels Director of Communications, Heather Buchter, is joined by the Executive Director of St. Louis Regional Clean Cities and Communities, Kevin Hurdler, to discuss how clean cities and communities are creating significant and lasting change in communities large and small. One project, one local decision, and one fleet at a time. Thanks, Scott. And Kevin, thank you for joining us in studio here in Jefferson City, driving down from St. Louis to be with us today. Yeah, I sure did. And this is this is an awesome studio. Well, thank you. We've been so excited to launch this podcast. I feel like we've had great content, great conversations so far. And, you know, we do a lot of these virtually, but it's always exciting when we can have someone in studio to yeah. talk to. Yeah, it's more fun being here in person. That's right. Yeah. And you got some clean fuel socks out of it too, yes. right? So, hey, yes, made it worthwhile to drive down, huh? Well, you know, we all know that it takes numerous partnerships to make this industry successful. And Clean Cities does play a pivotal role in that. You've been involved in Clean Cities since its inception back in 1993. So, let's rewind the clock and tell me how Clean Cities got started and also how you got involved. Okay. So, yeah, it shows how old I am. Oh, no, it doesn't at all. <laughs> well, yeah, I was a fleet director in uh, Rockdale County, Georgia, about 750 vehicles. And uh, a couple of guys came to me and said, hey, you know, we're starting this program here in, in Atlanta, and it's going to be a nationwide program, and we want to know if you want to get involved. And it was about uh, clean cities. And at the time, it came out because of the Clean Air Act of 1990 and the EPACT Act of 92. And so they kind of showed me the ropes and what they were doing. And, and then really, the reason why I got involved more than anything was, you know, we were, we were doing a, an awful lot of foreign oil, you know, bringing in for gas and diesel. And so I was interested in that, but really kind of tipped me was that they were talking about how it's going to create jobs. Mm -hmm. And for me, that really hit home. I really liked the part about the jobs. So that's really what got me involved in it more than anything else. And so I started going to some meetings and that, and they were already had gotten uh, their designation. So I kind of came in right at the very beginning of it, and I got involved in the infrastructure program. And so I was helping... Don Francis, who was a Clean Cities Corps, who's retired, he was with uh, Georgia Power and Light. And so we were putting in a bunch of electric charging systems. And we also had uh, Dennis Smith, who ran the program for several years, but he was with Atlanta Gas. And so we were putting in CNG stations. And then uh, in 98, I decided to relocate back here to St. Louis, where I'm originally from. Yeah, I immediately got involved in the St. Louis program, and and the gentleman that was running it then, he didn't really want to do that. He was interested in the NAFO Association, which is Natural Fleet uh, Manager Association. He wanted to do that, and I said, well, I'll take the Clean Cities Natural program. Fit. I want to do it, you know? <laughs> so I, I took over uh, basically in 99 and 2000. We, we kicked it all back off because St. Louis was kind of dying down. This uh, 94, we became a designated city, so we're on our 30 year this year. So, mm -hmm. And I've been in it ever since. Um, I was working for a city government back then as a fleet director. And then in uh, 2007, I decided to make it a nonprofit because I knew if I wanted to get grants, I needed to be a nonprofit. Yeah. 2009, I decided I had so many grants going, I either had to hire somebody or do it myself, so... I went for it. That's great. And and you've been with it ever since. Correct. No, that's a fantastic story. And and we should mention, this is part of the Department of Energy? Yes. It's Department of Energy, Vehicle, and Technologies. And we're a, we're a partnership with them. So okay. 
there's 75, a little more than 75 of us across the country. And when, like I say, you know, all different aspects. There's myself as a standalone nonprofit, but we're in universities, we're in city governments, state governments. Uh, we just, uh, the group of us get together annually and we meet on conference calls and, you know, we share projects. And mm -hmm. so, you know, like currently I have projects with, oh gosh, 10 other states and one grant and 14 states with another grant. So we all work together for the same outcome. Well, and I know every year at our conference, at the Clean Fuels Conference, we have a number of clean cities uh, directors who come, and that's just another opportunity to collaborate. But we also appreciate that partnership, too, because a lot of our goals align. Correct. Yeah, they actually do. I mean, I think I even mentioned this at one of our conferences a couple of years ago that you make our job easy because, you know, it's an easy fuel you don't have to modify anything. You can just drop and go, and you got the same mission we've got, to reduce carbon, to clean the air, mm -hmm. and uh, to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, even just petroleum. It's, you just make my job a lot easier. <laughs> well, right back at you. <laughs> it, it, like you said, it's a partnership. It takes a lot of the the partnerships to, to reach the goals that you're trying to get to. Um, and go ahead and describe a little bit who all is associated with the coalitions, because I know it's it's not just fleets and, you know, associations getting together. There's policy involved and um, businesses involved. So is it really centrally community focused or how how wide is that network? So under the program, it's a, it's a local program. And then, you know, that falls into because businesses aren't just in one city, they're spread out everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that we end up working with companies all across the country. We used to have a program called National Partners, and uh, and so it was the the PepsiCo's and the UPS and and everybody, you know. So we do work, even though each one of us work locally, you know, with local fleets. Uh, we do work on a national level, and we yeah. work on a regional level. Very good. Um, what what are some of the successes? Some of the highlights that you can give us um, from over the years. Well, one thing I can say is that, you know, one of the things that's kind of impressive is that we removed 72 million tons of greenhouse gases, you know, so that's pretty Kudos. impressive <laughs> yeah. across the country. It's a good you number. Know, and, and like 1.6 million alternative fuel vehicles on the road. Uh, in the St. Louis area or in Missouri, or at least the eastern half of Missouri, we've, uh, you know, we annually replace about 21 million gallons, which... It's just probably a drop in the bucket, but every little bit helps. Exactly. And it's always over 100,000 tons of emissions reduced. You know? So we go out there and we work with fleets. And really, you know, we went through the, the name change like you guys did. Mm -hmm. We realized that, you know, in the beginning, it was all about fleets. You know, we didn't work with the general public at all. Because you get in your car, you drive to work 20 minutes, then you get in a company truck and you drive for six or eight hours. Yeah. And that's the fuel you use. And then you get in your car and you go home. So, you know, we were we were focused strictly on fleets. But now with the electric vehicle craze that's going on, all of a sudden now we're, we've got general public coming to us mm -hmm. asking all these questions and how can we help them. So I think that's kind of what brought in the – the clean cities and communities. Yeah, because communities used to not be part of the name. It was just no. clean cities, correct? No. Correct. Yeah, and I feel like there is just an appetite and people are more interested and they're kind of paying attention to these things. And it's nice to have, you know, someone on the ground locally who can help you meet these decarbonization goals. That's right. And yep. that's, that's what we try to do. So. You know, I also read that more than $10 billion in federal funds have gone to helping schools decarbonize. How, how does that work? Because, yeah, school buses take kids to and from school, and that's that's a heavy-duty transportation vehicle. It is, and, and that's that's been the push, you know, let's get these kids on clean buses. And, uh, you know, truthfully, the, you know, it's going mostly to electric school buses. Mm -hmm. And mainly that's because— you know, a, a diesel school bus is kind of tough, especially in an urban area where it's start and stop, start and stop. Yeah. And so that really plays hard on the DEF system and regenerative system. So, you know, looking at alternatives for that, I had a grant, gosh, it's been 
10 years ago, I guess, that I bought 62 CNG buses for Parkway School District over the years. And, How about that? And what was funny about that is that the school bus drivers loved them. They really loved them because the kids weren't screaming over the the old diesel engines. <laughs> yeah. And the parents hated it because they didn't hear the bus come in. Oh, in the yeah. That was like things you don't even think about. <laughs> things huh? you don't think about. Yeah. They had to turn around and go back and get so many kids in the early, you know, couple of weeks of, of when the <laughs> buses first started rolling. Had to start honking the horn yeah. at each stop. Huh? So I'm sure they're in the same boat now with the electric school buses. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That, that, that does bring up a good point, though, too, because, you know, we here at Clean Fuels Alliance, Alliance America, we're for innovation, and we recognize it is going to take multiple solutions to reach these net carbon goals. Right. And, you know, obviously, biodiesel, renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel being part of that solution. But you're also looking at the big picture, too, and incorporating those as solutions, but also looking at, you know, what else can work now and how can we meet um, current carbon reduction goals within our communities? Yeah, and that's a uh Biodiesel and renewable diesel. I mean, that's the that's the easiest fuel for any fleet right now to get involved in, and and I push at it, you know, whenever I'm talking, you know, because you buy an electric school bus is over four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. How does a small community afford that? But they can drop in biodiesel with no upfront costs at all, except buying the fuel, and and they're out and running, and they're and they're making a difference. They're making a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, and the lifespan of these vehicles too yeah. is not just ten years, you right. know, like it is with some vehicles yeah. nowadays. Yeah, we've got a lot of buses out there that are twenty years old and still taking kids to school. So, put them on biodiesel. That's a that's the easiest thing to do. Or you know, if you're in an area where you can't get renewable diesel, you know, get renewable diesel. This is the Better Cleaner Now podcast. And I'm Heather Buchter, Director of Communications for Clean Fuels Alliance America, and we have the pleasure of having Kevin Hurdler with us today. He's with Clean Cities and Communities out of St. Louis. Kevin, we've been talking a lot about the fuels. Talk to us about the infrastructure it takes, too, and are you on, is Clean Cities involved in building infrastructure to help implement these new technologies? Absolutely. We have, and it's part of the, all the grants, even part of the Seven billion that you were talking about earlier. You know, in order to make these vehicles run, we've got to have infrastructure. We have gas stations on every corner, sometimes multiple stations on every corner. So, so now we're trying to grow. You know, those gas stations, but EV charging stations, propane stations, natural gas stations, uh, hydrogen stations. Yeah, looking <laughs> we, at it all. Yeah, looking at it all. You know, so there's incentives out there. Our job is to. Our job really is clean cities is we're kind of consultants. You know, we uh, we find the fleet and then we find what that fleet needs. We help them do a fleet analysis. Uh, and then once they, you know, sometimes they come to us and say, okay, we want this fuel, you know. But other times they say, we don't know what we want to do, but we want to decarbonize. So then we help them figure out what's the best opportunities for them to do. And then once we figure that out, then we start connecting the dots. We hook them up with vendors, fuel providers, you know, then we let them hash it out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just making the connections. We are fuel and vendor agnostic. Yes. Know? There's no silver bullet. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's got to be all the fuels. That's well, the only way it's going to work. And I think, you know, a lot of people might have these decarbonization goals, a lot of companies, but they're like, where do we begin? And what is the technology and the data and all that say? And what, yeah, how do we make the most informed decision for what we want to accomplish today? Does clean cities and communities do research or how does that partnership work with the Department of Energy in utilizing those resources? Right. So we work with uh, all the labs. Argonne, Enrail, you know, we Oak Ridge. We work with them all to test the technologies that are out there and then make sure that they're actually working, they're going to work, you mm-hmm. know. And then from there, you know, then we work directly with Department of Energy on what we can do from there on, on you know, getting these fuels and these technologies out there. And it isn't just the fuels. I mean, we do, we do the uh, smart way program under EPA where we, support trailer skirts and APUs, auxiliary power units and bus 
heaters, you know. Yeah. A lot of your electric buses are out there are running diesel still so they can heat the bus. You oh, know? yeah, that's so, something you don't really think about, but right. that, that could be running on biodiesel right. too. And I, and actually I'm working with one manufacturer to do a B100 uh, heater. How about that? So, yeah, and that's in the St. Louis area? Uh, well, it's... They're not in the St. Louis area. They're mm-hmm. in Canada and across the country. Yeah. So I'm working with them, getting them biodiesel nice. to, to do some tests and to I, see if their unit can run. Since a future podcast on that, once we get some more information. Yeah. Um, okay. So we talked about the name change. I um, also want to talk about another role that you have, which is with Clean Fuels Alliance America. A lot of times you go out to these trade shows and having so much experience and knowledge in this industry and with clean cities. You um, are a great representative and specialize in original equipment manufacturers and biodiesel outreach. So go ahead and explain to us how um, your Clean Cities position helps you convey this message and and talk on our behalf as well. Right. So when we're working for you guys, we we also are promoting the St. Louis Clean Cities and Clean Cities in general across the country. Coming from a fleet background, that gives me the opportunity to talk to these guys in their language. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a great relationship. You know, I get to see fleets that, you know, they come year after year to the different conferences I Mm -hmm. do for you. So I get to see them year after year and and check in on them and see how their projects are going. And, you know, a lot of these fleets still don't realize that biodiesel is out there or that renewable diesel is out there. So... Uh, you know, it's a lot of education. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just uh, just spreading the word. That's right. <laughs> Always spreading the word. And there is mounting pressure, I would say, for fleets to decarbonize. What do you find is a message that's resonating with them? Uh, <laughs> I think the, uh, the message that's resonating with them is that you don't have to buy electric. There are other options out there. Mm-hmm. And biodiesel, renewable diesel is one of them. And... Uh, you know, they're, they're getting this drive from upper management to electrify. And electricity, as well as it's going to be, and as great as it's going to be somewhere down the road, it's too expensive right now for for a fleet to, to go to that. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, you know, $400,000 school bus or $1.2 million transit bus. Yeah. Think of how many uh, Optimus systems you could put on and get mm-hmm. the same end result. Exactly, yeah, and that Optimus uh, Technologies Vector System actually allows B100 use on some of these um, heavy-duty applications as well. So mm-hmm. it's it's an option, it's out there, and like you said, education is just such a key part to, you know, just letting people know it's available now, <laughs> and right you can now. make that transition now and start working towards these decarbonization goals um, on your own, too. Correct, and, and it, you know, I mean, I'm sure... You know, another ten years down the road, we'll we'll be a lot farther along with the electric vehicle, and hopefully, it'll be a you know more a realistic price that these fleets can afford. But there's still going to be diesels on the road mm-hmm. for you know probably the next fifty years because they don't you know fleets don't get rid of their stuff; they drive them until they're dead in the water. Yeah, yeah, and if they do get something new, it's usually passed on to a different fleet, so <laughs> someone else is using it. Yeah, until it's dead in the water. <laughs> Um, well, one more question for you before I let you take off, um, okay. and this one's a little personal too. Okay. What are you most proud of with your work with <laughs> clean cities and communities? I think just the fact that I was able to work with all these different fleets. I mean, I've had some fantastic grants over the years that I, I think one of my, I, I've got a couple of stories that I, that I really am proud of. One was when I was just doing diesel fired heaters on school buses and, uh, we did them for our special school district in St. Louis. I think I put on 150 of them for a grant. And uh, they were so impressed with a diesel-fired heater, they don't have to bring a mechanic in at 4.30 in the morning to start the buses when the drivers get there. The diesel fire here heats it up and makes it run, warms all the water, and makes the inside of the cab warm. And the drivers were saying... When they put the kids on, they didn't have to wrap them in blankets. Oh, wow. You know, the, the bus was already warm for them. So yeah. that was a big hit. Uh, the other is uh, working with uh, Darren Peters at Rockwood School District. Uh, gosh, I guess it's been maybe 12 years ago. 
he was talking about biodiesel in the class. And uh, a little girl went home that night, came in the next morning with a sack about two inches thick and said, Mr. Peters, we got to do this. And wow. that started the biodiesel program. And they can make 400 gallons a week. Wow. And they do it with the cafeteria grease from all the schools. It's, it's just been a fantastic program to, to get kids involved. I mean, mm-hmm. to get the kids involved, that's just, you know. And sparking you know, that innovation that sparking and that, curiosity. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, you mentioned jobs earlier, too. Do you feel like you've seen a lot of job creation throughout the years? Yeah, with each one of the fuels, you know, I mean, there's got to be infrastructure put in. There's got to be somebody to put the kits on. You know, it's so a network. It's a network, and it's all American stuff. You mm-hmm. know, it's American made, and and that to me is what it's all about. I guess ex military makes me, you know, a little bit more <laughs> pro American. Well, we thank you for your service, <laughs> absolutely, and yeah, just thanks for all the work that you do, um, connecting fleets with the right states and the right people, and helping spread the word and educate. That's what it's all about. Yes, it is. All right, Kevin Hurdler, the Executive Director for Clean Cities and Communities in St. Louis. Thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Heather. All right, Kevin, Heather, thank you. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoy the show and you have a moment and can give us a rating, it helps the show grow, and, and we appreciate that. And if you really want to go for it, leave us a review. We might just read it here. So please do that wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have any questions for our experts or a suggestion for a future topic or guest, you can email us at podcasts at cleanfuels.org. And join us next week for another episode of the Better Cleaner Now podcast. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. To catch all the latest from Clean Fuels Alliance America, follow us at cleanfuels.org. The Better, Cleaner, Now podcast is a production of Clean Fuels Alliance America. That's all for us. Now it's your turn to be better, cleaner, now.